We are talking about the Passion Week of Jesus Christ, the last days of his life. That's where we're at in our study of the gospel according to Luke. Uh, that week has also been referred to as the greatest week in human history. Uh, it absolutely changed the world, did it not? It's the greatest week in human history. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I was thinking about that. Uh, you know, Jesus is an historic fact. Uh, God came down <laughs> into our history. He entered into human history. We're not asked to follow some guru's philosophy, you know, uh, that, about something that really isn't relevant or didn't really happen. What, what, what we're expected to do is believe in a person who is real. You know, even, uh, even those who claim they don't believe in God and, and don't believe in Jesus, they still do Jesus, you know. Uh, they still do Christmas, right? And what's Christmas about? <laughs> it's about the coming <laughs> into our history of the Son of God. And, and they, they do Easter. You know, and believe it or not, but Easter really isn't about Easter bunnies and eggs. It's, Easter's really about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, and they do it. They, you know, and... and the, the, the point that I'm wanting to see, make here is, is that we can, we can receive Jesus or we can reject Jesus, but we can't do away with Jesus. You may think you can, but you can't because he's real. He happened. <laughs> he, he, he is here. <laughs> uh, you know, and, we're, and I said reject him, uh, and that's what we're going to be talking about today, how, how, he, how he responds to people who, who reject him. So it's going to be an interesting uh, topic, I think, for us today. We'll, hopefully, we'll, we'll get some insight into some depth of, of some things that we can uh, change our, our, our own lives, but, but even our, our, our nation concerning. So that's what I'm after. As you recall, it's the Passion Week of Jesus Christ. We are in Wednesday of that, of that week. Uh, that's where we left off last time. Jesus had been preaching and teaching in the temple. Large crowds were coming to hear him and to see him. He has sort of taken over uh, the temple with the crowds. And uh, the religious leaders and the national leaders, they, they, they were the same. They operated in a thearchy. And, and so they were, they, they, they'd come uh, upon him, it said, and they, they were asking him this question, who gave you authority to do the things you're doing? And then Jesus responded to him with a question. He, 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 the answer was a question. He said, that basically, if you answer this question, you'll have your answer. And they did it. And they, they refused to answer his question. And so he ended it with saying, well, then I'll refuse to answer what you're asking me. Now, we pick up right there. That wasn't the end of that experience and that confrontation. We're going to pick it up right there with, with, the, uh, with the reading that we have today in Luke chapter 20 and verse 9. It says, he went on to tell the people this parable. So this is a continuation of that confrontation. He went on to tell the people this parable. Now, <clears throat> now many, most of you know what a parable is. You've heard, heard it talked about. Uh, what the, it's the Greek word parabole. It means the laying alongside uh, of something. Uh, in, in this particular case, uh, the definition even talks about ships in battle. So what we lay alongside, and this thing is going to blast into our lives. It's going to blast into our lives, and we're going to see what it hits in our lives, because it's what, it, what this parable hits in our lives is, is where the parable is aimed and what it should accomplish in our lives. So he, he began to tell them this parable, and he says this, A man planted a vineyard, rented it to some, some farmers, and went away for a, how long? A, a, a long time, right? Now, I'm going to, just, I'm going to make a point here. Um, it has nothing to do really with, with the lesson. But does Jesus know the difference between a long time and quickly? Do, do you think he does? Does he know the difference of a long time and at hand? In other words, what I'm trying to get to is, is a long time is, 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 you know, is different from a quick time. When Jesus says 2,000 years, you know, does he ever say 2,000 years? Does, is quickly 2,000 years? And, and I think you know what I'm trying to, to get across here. You know, when, when God says a long time, he means a long time. He, he, he's not confused about the time thing. I mean, okay, just, just enough. At, at harvest time, he sent a servant to the, to the tenants so they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. He sent another servant, but that one also they beat. And treated him shamefully and sent him away empty handed. And he sent, st sent still a third. Now, he's quite patient, isn't he? He sent still a third. 
And they wounded him and threw him out. And then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall we do? I got it. I will send my son whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the, talked the matter over. They deliberated, right? They, they, they uh, deliberately, they, they, they premeditated this thing. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him. And the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Now, what is that? And then the people heard this. They said, may this never be. And that's our title. May this never be. This can't happen to us. We're the people of God. Jesus looked directly at them and asked, well, then what does it mean? What is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the, the, the capstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, <laughs> but he on whom the, it falls will be crushed. Okay, so it, it's not a difficult parable. It, it's also given to us in the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Mark, and, and Luke as well. Matthew 21, uh, Mark 12. And so it, it, by comparison, Making a composition of, of all of these, we will we'll get a fuller understanding of all that is meant here. And, and, of course, this is what we do. But what the parable is actually about is a premeditated murder of Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. And he's telling them, I know your plans, but I'm not running. I, I know your plans. I'm not afraid of you. I know your plans. Isn't it, isn't it sometimes scary to know that God knows our plans? <laughs> Yeah, kind of helps us keep them pure, doesn't it? God knows our plans. Now, he, he has plans for us, but he knows our plans. If we're going to serve him, if we're going to reject him, he, he knows our plans. So, so this, is, this is what it's about. But, but it's not only about them murdering him. Jesus goes on here, and he talks about taking this vineyard and giving it to others. Who is that, and what is that about? And, and he also talks about this stone thing. You know, if, if you fall on the stone, you're broken to pieces. But if the stone falls on you, you're crushed. So, so what's that about? I don't want to talk about that as well. Now, again, the, the, uh, the parable is not difficult. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure this one out. At, at all. Uh, it, it's very simple, and Jesus made it that way uh, on this particular one. Now, now, some of his, it does take a rocket scientist. And, you know, if you, if you recall, you know, some of, he'd tell a parable, and the disciples would say, hey, hey, Jesus, Jesus, come, come here a minute, come here. I, I, gotta, I, don't, I don't understand. Hell, hell, tell us what you meant here. Tell us what you meant. But not this one. This one is so clear, anybody can get it. And so that's what we're going to do, but we're going to get the characters. I'm going to show you, uh, hopefully, hopefully to, how, uh, to properly interpret the Word of God and help you there. But, but we're going to look at the characters. And, and so this was a common thing that all the people could relate to. Uh, the, uh, he talks first there about an owner or a man who had property and he planted a vineyard on it. And, and then he talks about, uh, about the late, lend it, lend it, lending it out, or renting it out. Now, in, in, in the country of Israel, just like any place else, they have flat, flat land and have hillsides. And, of course, on the flat ground, they would plant grain crops, um, wheat, barley. On the hillside, they plant a vineyard. And so this is common. Everybody understood all, all of this. And, but this particular vineyard was pretty special. Uh, in Matthew's account of it, he goes into great detail of all the expense and and preparation that he did, and it evidently was a, a huge vineyard because he, in Matthew's account of it, he, he built this big watchtower so they could watch for people you know, coming and taking things that weren't there or, or watch for animals or, or whatever. So Matthew talks about how, how, you know, how to, the, to the extent of this, of this vineyard, how, how magnificent it was and how, what an opportunity that he was offering to these tenants. And, and then he, he says he went away for a long time and he, and he rented it out or he leased it out to these farmer tenants. And that was common too. People who were rich enough and wealthy enough to own a vineyard didn't tend it. They rented it out. So again, this is all very, very common stuff that he was telling them. But not only was it common uh, and for them to understand and relate to it, it was extremely common in the scriptures. 
And they could immediately begin to understand what he's talking about. It was, a, it, was, it was something they could immediately grasp and then begin to interpret straight out of the Word of God. And so that's what we want to do. We want to get our characters and as much information as we can from the Word of God. So let's do that. So in Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 7, it says this. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel. So let's stop. All right. Who is, who's the owner? Uh, who is... Who's the man who owns the vineyard, according to that verse? The Lord Almighty, right? And who is the vineyard? The house of Israel, the nation of Israel, the people of Judah. He goes on to say here, and the men of Judah are the garden of his delight. And he looked for fruit, or he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed. For righteousness, he looked for righteousness, but you heard the cries of distress. So the fruit that he wanted, he wasn't getting. Now, the people were distressed. It was bloodshed. Why? And this is what I really want to draw from this. Why didn't he get the fruit? Why, why, what's going on here? What stopped him from getting the fruit that he was looking for? Now, I think it's very clear who, who these characters are. But I want to point out to you and make sure that you understand the best way to interpret Scripture is with Scripture. You, you will never, ever go wrong. You'll never miss it if you interpret Scripture with Scripture. Right? And this includes the book of Revelation. <laughs> In fact, specifically. And <laughs> because if you listen to this other stuff... You're going to get an impure interpretation. We went through it in 97, 98, and 99, the book of Revelation, the three-year study that we took on then. And, 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 you know, and we, we allowed the scriptures, and only the scriptures, to interpret. We didn't, we didn't let the books that are out there flying around. Uh, because because the, if you want a, a pure interpretation, better than, better than word definition, that helps. That's always good. Better than context, that's always good, and that always helps. But the best way, the number one way that you can interpret scripture is let scripture interpret itself. Because <laughs> you'll always get it right then. So it's clear here who, who these characters are. Then I want to read another verse from that same passage in Isaiah that uh, will help us and give us a little more insight to this thing. So in Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 5 it says, Now I will tell you what I am going to do to my vineyard. Now what I'm pointing out here is, is the ownership, uh, responsibility. Uh, it's his vineyard, Right? So this is, this, is the, this is the Lord Almighty talking. I will take away its hedge, and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall, and it will be trampled. Now, it's, it's his vineyard. He's doing it. Now, he always disguises himself. Uh, he, see, here, what, what Isaiah is telling us is it's 586 B.C. Uh, this is just before the Babylonians came upon Israel. Now, was that the Babylonians or was that God disguised as the Babylonians? I mean, you know, what, what I want you to see here, because what they did is they took the, the nation into 70 years of Babylonian captivity and they crushed the nation. They, they tore down the walls, burned them, uh, crushed the temple, tore it apart, took people away into, into slavery, into captivity. But God says, I, I'm, I'm really doing that. So, God comes, and, and, it's, and it's strange, but, but he's taking ownership here. He's taking ownership of, of this thing. <laughs> so, so it, it, and there's a lot of, of scriptures that, that I give you here in your notes, uh, but uh, and I'm not going to read them all. I think we easily see how clear it is who the vineyard is and, and who, who the owner here is. But I do want to look at one more to begin to make this applicable to us. And that's always a challenge sometimes to make things applicable. So, but in Psalms 80 and verse 8, it's here talking about the same thing, uh, the gorgeousness of the vineyard, the beauty of the vineyard, but then how it's, how it's destroyed. But I just want to pull out particular aspects of this thing here so we can begin to make this relevant. In uh, Psalms 80 and verse 8, it says this, you, speaking about God, you brought a vine out of Egypt. Now, we're, we're talking about here the, the Egyptian uh, bondage that the people of God were in and the deliverance. Remember, uh, um, Charlton Heston opening up the Red Sea and... <laughs> Also known as Moses, right? so so, and all the plagues that came and, and the deliverance. So so, if you've ever planted a vine, it's just a little stick with a little ball of roots on it. That's all it is. And this is what he's saying. I brought the vine. So we know who the vine is. We know who he brought out of Egypt. It was it was the people of Israel, and you drove out the nations. Now this, of course, was the land of Canaan. You have the you know the Amorites and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Perizzites and the, 
you know, in the, <laughs> you, you know, you, you, have, you have all of these uh, ites that, that were there, parasites and all those. And, and, and <laughs> so he, he, he drove them out and he planted it. He planted, he planted the, the nation right there in the land of Canaan. He says, you cleared the ground for it, and it took root, and it filled the land. It was a beautiful thing that, it, that happened. The mountains were covered with, with its shade, its mighty cedars, with the branches. It's, it sent out the bras to the sea. It, shot, it, it shot, shuts as far as the river. It shoots as far as the river. And so, so it became a beautiful thing, a, a land of privilege and a land of opportunity, right? And no nation had ever been blessed like this. No nation had God ever took it, taken under his wing and, and done this for. He raised up David and he raised up Solomon and it was a world power. And God did this for them. It was a beautiful thing. Does it, you know, it was a land of opportunity. Does that remind you of any, of any other nation? Who? America. Actually called the land of opportunity from sea to shining sea. Land of the beauty. Beautiful. No nation in the history of humanity has ever been blessed by God like this nation. We have more than anybody who's ever existed. This nation is the land of opportunity and privilege. God has blessed us. We have opportunity in every, every area of life and freedom. Opportunity to, for wealth. Opportunity for education. Opportunity to do anything we want to do. We have abundance of everything. More than anybody's ever been blessed. Ever in, in the history of humanity. But something's happening. Something's changing. We're not the nation we once were. Why? Why? What's the problem? And what I'm really wanting to do is hopefully draw from this parable that an answer or answers perhaps that we can apply to that question. Why? What's going on? Is there anything we can do to, to change the direction of, of our nation? Where is it going to be a hundred years from now? What's it going to look like? What, what of our children, our grandchildren, what are they going to experience? Because more and more and more we're rejecting God and rejecting Jesus. More and more and more. What's going on? So I want to draw some thoughts from that, and, and hopefully we can, we can learn some things here from it, okay? So we, we need to look at now some more, more characters in this, in this parable and see if we can, uh, we can get more, in, more insight into it. So let's read verse 19. Okay, that's what I, I don't want to read that yet. What I want to do is I want to ask you first a question. So what we need to do is, now who would be then the, uh, the, the, uh, the tenants, who, who would be these tenant farmers? Who, who do you think they would be? Pardon? Okay, good. That's a good answer. Great answer. In fact, we don't have to guess. In fact, we don't even have to go to the Old Testament. Because at the very end of, of this reading here, the last verse that we'll be looking at today, we're told. So let's read that in verse 19. It says, The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately. Because, why? They knew, not... Not suspected. <laughs> they knew he had spoken this parable against them. So they are the tenants. They're, they're, the, they're the ones. They're the, they're the, the nation's leaders. These are the, these are the dudes here. So, so the nation's leaders um, did this. Um, they were, they were the, the leaders of, of, of their nation. Uh, uh, it would be the high priest. It would be the chief priest. And then it would be the Sanhedrin. And, you know, and, 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 you know, and, and then it would be the teachers of the law. And, and when we look at this thing, and if we will allow it to fire into our lives, what we're going to see is that there's a tremendous parallel with that nation and this nation, our nation. The, the high priest would be very similar to the president. And then you got the chief priest who would be very, very similar to the cabinet because the, the duty of the chief priest were to give wisdom and guidance and, and insight and, and, you know, and, and help for, for the high priest. That's what they're doing. So the cabinet, that's the purpose of the cabinet the, of, of the presidency. And then, and then you have the, the, their Sanhedrin, which would be our Congress, made up of senators or Pharisees and 
you know, and, and congressmen, you know, but, but it, even within this, even within this, what, what you've got are, are the very, very liberal Sadducees, the very conservative Pharisees, and then right there in the center, you've got the Herodians. So, so you, you see a, a tremendous similarity here. And then their teachers of the law or lawyers would be our Supreme Court, made up of lawyers, of course. Because their, their jo uh, job is, in the Supreme Court, is to, is to interpret the law of Moses, their constitution. The purpose of our Supreme Court is to do that. That's what they're supposed to do. And that's what, and that's what, that's what their lawyers were, were to do as well. So there's a tremendous likeness here. Do our nation's leaders have a clue as to where they're taking our nation by turning away from God and rejecting Jesus. Do they have a clue? They have a clue. Where will we be a hundred years from now? Where your grandchildren, your great grandchildren, a hundred years from now, what will this be like? What will it look like if we continue down the route we're going? What can we do? Well, we can do what they do, they, do what they say. May this never be. Isn't that pretty much what we do? This could never happen to us. May this never be. I hope it never happens to us. Well, then what does it mean when it says, if you reject the stone, the stone comes on you? So I want to draw from this. I want, to, I want us to find something that we can do as, as individuals and maybe what's causing even more of this than that. So, so let's go on and let's, let's, let's attempt to, to, to get this done. So let's look at some more characters that are in this, that are in this, uh, in this thing. Who, who, who are the servants that were sent that were rejected? Uh, and in Matthew's gospel, it says that they were stoned and they were killed. Who, who, uh, who, who were they be? Who do you think they are? Okay. Well, again, okay, we, we, got, we got it, but, but let's, let's, uh, let's read it out of, right out of the Bible in Jeremiah 7.25. It says, uh, from the time your forefathers left Egypt, Moses, until now, Jeremiah, day after day, again and again, I sent you my servants, servants the prophets. prophets. Well, there you are. So this is what, this is what Jesus is, is drawing straight out of the word and, and telling them. But they did not listen to me or pay attention. They were stiff-necked and did not and did more evil than their than their forefathers. Now I want you to hold on to that forefather thing, because what 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 what, what Jeremiah is saying here to us is that every generation got worse. The children got worse and worse and worse. Every generation got further and further away from God. Every generation uh, got further and further uh, distant from the things of God. So the history of Israel is, is really nothing more than their resistance and rejection of the prophets. It's, it's again and again and again and again. Uh, it's, it's over and over and over and over uh, from, from the time of Moses all the way through. Uh, they rejected the prophets of God, and, and they would kill them. They, they, took, uh, they, they cut uh, Isaiah in half. Uh, you read in the, in the book of Hebrews where they were sawed asunder and fed the lions and all these kinds of things. They, they took Jeremiah, they beat him first, and they threw him in a pit because he wouldn't stop. He had a fire in his bones. And then, and then finally they stoned him to death, put the fire out. But God sent another. <laughs> and and Zechariah, they stoned to death. And so, so this is what was happening over and over and over, over again. Now, Jesus also comments on this, but I've got to set it up just a little bit. In Matthew's um, account, Matthew's writing about this day, Wednesday, uh, of, of the Passion Week. When, when he's writing of this account, this is the day when Jesus is in the temple and he's blasting the Pharisees. He says to them, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Right? And he goes eight times with these blasts. And he comes down to the conclusion of that and he says, you're snakes. In fact, you're a generation of snakes. In, in other words... Again, we're seeing here that it got worse and got worse and got worse. They, they drew people away from God and finally come to the place where there stood God right in front of them in the, in the body of Jesus Christ, and they kill him. That's how far those leaders had taken that nation away from God. They killed him. And so Jesus says this right there 
In Matthew 23, 58, 35, excuse me, Matthew 23, 35, it says, And so upon you, the national leader specifically is who he's talking about here, you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berkiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Now that's a lot of blood. He goes all the way back to Abel. And he says, it's all going to come on you. <laughs> I tell you the truth. You're ahead of me. I tell you the truth. All this. How much of it? All, all this will come upon a generation, 2,000, 3,000, you know. No, God knows the difference of long and, 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 and quickly. <laughs> upon this generation. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. So we clear, we know who the prophets are. How often I long to gather you, your, your, your children together, as, as hen gathers her chicks under her wing, but you are not willing. Look, your house, your vineyard, is left to you desolate. So there's no doubt, is there, about who, who the servants are, right? Sent from God to the people to draw them to God, not take them away from God. But they would kill him. Um, and, and so we, we know who Jesus is, is clearly speaking about here. But, but what about us? What about us? Have, have you ever rejected somebody that God possibly could have sent to you uh, to draw you closer to God? Um, have you ever sliced a preacher up with your tongue? Maybe at lunch? <laughs> um, have you ever stoned a man or woman of God with your words? Hmm? Ha! You know. <laughs> See, I have. I have. And, uh, but I'm learning to repent. Learning. Because I've learned, I figured out that, you know what, God doesn't take likely to me cutting people up and stoning people with words. In fact, in fact what I've learned is that it really doesn't bother them at all. They don't even know I'm doing it. I'll scream at the television. The guy doesn't even know I live. It's not hurting them, but it's heaping the stone on me. <laughs> yeah. And so what I'm learning to do is shut my mouth and keep my mind open. There may be something there. I'm learning to television off, turn the television off, which usually turns my mouth off and lets my mind stay open. And I know you know what I'm talking about. You know, God doesn't take kindly to us, and it doesn't have to be a preacher. It can be your friend. It can be your child. It can be your parents. It can be anybody who's coming to you, trying to bring you closer to God. And you resist, and you go home, and you cut them up, and you stone them. We all have done it. But I see something more. Something a little deeper that I think I'll, I'm going to attempt to communicate it. You see, Jeremiah was talking about, he, he, said, he said, your forefathers, and, and how the generations got worse and worse and worse. And, and, then, he, and, then, and then Jesus says, you're a, you're a, you're a generation of vipers, you know, you're a generation of snakes. And the generations got worse and worse and worse until they finally came to the generations that killed Jesus. You see, our kids, our children hear us slice and dice people. And unknowingly and unintentionally, we're giving them permission to do the same thing. And so they start slicing and dicing men, women, doesn't matter who, preachers, anybody. Just cut them up. I don't, I don't agree with it. I don't like it. I don't like what's said. Just stone them. And so what they do is they, they have this, this mentality that I don't have to accept what they say. I can interpret it any way I want to. I can live like I want to. I can get it further away from God. It's okay. I can reject Jesus. It's okay. And we give them permission unknowingly and unintentionally. But every generation, think about it, every generation gets further and further and further from God until a generation is going to come along in our nation who's going to kill him. What can we do about that? So I want you to understand this. I want you to, want you to kind of see what I'm saying here. 
So let's, let's, let's go on now to, with, and look at some more characters in, in this parable. In Luke uh, chapter 20, verse 13, it says, Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I got it. I'll send my son, whom I love, and perhaps they will respect him. Now, we have no, no problem here knowing who this is, this is, do we? I mean, it's, it's Jesus, the Son of God. And in and, and Luke 3, 23, Jesus is at water of baptism. John baptizing. The heavens open. A voice comes from heaven. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So, so there's no problem. We're not going to spend time there. So, in, but in, in, going into Luke chapter 20, verse 14, it says, But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. <laughs> they, they had already had it figured out. They premeditated this thing. They talked the matter over. This is the heir. That means they knew who he was. And they said, let's kill him. And the inheritance will be ours. We can keep doing what we want to do. So they threw him out. And they did. They threw him out of Jerusalem, took him out of Jerusalem and the vineyard, and they killed him. Now, now, now we, 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 we got this. We got this. And, and, and this has already happened, and I already told you that in the, in the Gospel of St. John, after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, the Sanhedrin called together this big meeting. And it's the whole, the whole bunch of them. And they were discussing what to do with Jesus. And what they determined is they, we got to kill him. Right. And, and the reason we got to kill him is because the people are following him. And what Rome's going to do is they're going to sense and smell an insurrection, and they're going to come upon our whole nation and shut our whole nation down. So it's better for one man to die for the whole nation. Caiaphas said that, high priest, the president. He said that. Then later in, in John chapter, chapter 12, uh, they, it says there that some of them actually believed in Jesus. They believed he was the Messiah. But they were afraid of men. They were afraid of being thrown out of the synagogues. They were afraid of the other leaders. But they believed, but they weren't going to say anything because they were afraid of people. Yeah. And, and, and not, they weren't afraid of God, but they were afraid of people. So, so, the, so, so, the, so they said, well, what, we, what we're going to do is we, we just can't, we can't acknowledge it. And then what the Bible says there is, is that, is that they, 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 they loved the praises of men more than the praises of God. So this had already been done by this time. Jesus is going to die in two days. All this had already taken place. And so they have to be thinking, well, how do you know that? But what Jesus is doing here is he's telling them, I know what you're planning. I know. And God knows what you're planning. But now I'm going to tell you what God and I am going to do to you. And this is what he says in the next, next verse. Verse 15. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants. <laughs> you know, yeah. You know, rejecting Jesus isn't good. Come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. And when the people heard this, they said, may this never be. I hope that doesn't happen. They got it. They got it, didn't they? they may this never be. They understood it. But this won't happen to us because we're the special ones. We're the children of God. Right? May this ne never be. So they got what Jesus was saying. They understood it, but they didn't do anything about it. Do we get it? Will we do anything about it? Or will we just say, oh, I hope this never happens. May this never be. And Jesus looks at us in the eye. And he says, well, then what does it mean? What does it mean when it's written that if you reject the stone, the stone's going to come back on you? We'll talk about that in just a second. In just a second. This is still another character that we've got to de define here and make sure we, uh, we understand. What it says is he's going to take that vineyard away from them and give it to others. Who are the others? Now, we, 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 we should know, right? It's, it's, it's the church. And Jesus had already put this into motion. In, in chapter 9, he had sent out the 12. He had given them authority to preach the kingdom of God. So what, there's, going to be, there's going to be custodians of, of the kingdom. And I want to read you this verse. It's out of Matthew in chapter 21 and verse 43 in Matthew's interpretation of this same thing. It says, there, there, therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to people who will produce its fruit. So there's new custodians for the kingdom. There's new custodians for the things of God. There's new custodians for the word of God, for the ministry of people. It's the church. Jesus had already put this in motion with the 12. He sent them out, preached the gospel, healed the sick. He'd already done that. He, then he gave authority to the 70, 72, 
And he sent them out with the same authority. So he'd already put this in motion. This was already taking place and happening. See, no Jewish leader was ever given that kind of authority. No Jewish leader was ever able to do what, what these people could do. And of course, it finally comes down to Ephesians 4, where he gave pastors and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. And then, of course, it comes into 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you and me, the body of Christ. Chapter 12 and verse 12, at verse 12, the apostle Paul begins this lengthy discourse about the body of Christ. The I can't say to the hand, I don't need you. Listen, together we can do anything. But when we, when we slice up the people that are bringing the word of God to us and we stone them to death, we're say divided. But together, there is nothing the church can't do. It's got absolute authority. We're the custodians of the kingdom of God. We're, we're the people of God and we're co- chosen and we're called to do it. Luke chapter 20 and verse 17. They had replied, may this never be. So Jesus looks them in the eye. Jesus looked directly at them and asked, then what is the meaning of that which is written? See, they're saying, it can't happen to us. This will never happen to us. We're the people of God. We're we're, we're America. Come on, Delbert. We're the most, well, 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 then what does it mean? What, what, What does this mean? What does it mean? Where, 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 then what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the capstone. And everyone who falls on, on that stone will be broken to pieces. And he, but he who, whom the, it falls will be crushed. Now the key word here is rejected. We get hung up on the stone parts. We know who the stone is, don't we? He's the capstone. He's the cornerstone. He's the storm, stone of stumbling. Jesus is the stone. I got you all these references here. That, that's not, it, it, it's, it, the aspect here is rejecting of Jesus. Right. No matter how you reject him, it's inevitable. Judgment is coming. No, no matter how, you take a pot, take a clay pot, and you drop a clay pot on a stone, what happens? It's broken. Take a big stone, drop it on a clay pot, what happens? Either way, it's inevitable. It's judged. I don't care who you are. You reject Jesus. Judgment is coming. It's inevitable. Whether you fall on it or it falls on you. You remember what happened to Judas Iscariot? See, Judas was, was one of his key followers. But Judas rejected him. And he attempting to hang himself, I suppose. He falls evidently on a stone. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 1 that his intestines burst out. I don't care who you are, how close you think you are, but if you reject Jesus, it's not good. There's no way you can do it and get by. The stone's coming. The stone is going to fall. And this happened. This happened. I don't care who you are or what nation it is or whatever, but, but, but this happened in AD 70. The, you hear me talk about it all the time. God disguised, the st- stone disguised as Roman army came. And it smashed, it crushed, it shattered that whole thing. People by the hundreds of thousands were slaughtered. Children, babies, pregnant women, men who weren't were taken off into slavery. 80, 70, one generation from the time Jesus said it would happen. That thing was crushed. The high priesthood was crushed. The Sanhedrin was crushed. The high priests were crushed. The animal sacrifice was crushed. The teachers of the law were crushed. Just like Jesus said, it was all done. It was all crushed. Why, why, why? Because a generation came along that took the people away from God and rejected Jesus and killed him nation's leaders. What will our nation's leaders do? Which direction are our nation's leaders taking us? Their nation leaders killed Jesus. What are our nation leaders doing? That really happened. See, that's a fact. That's a historical fact. That's not made up. 
Jesus says, then what does it mean? What, what does it mean? Listen, we can say all we want to say. May it never be. But if we keep heading the way we're heading, it will be. Because what does it mean? What does it mean if you reject the stone? It doesn't matter if you fall on it or it falls on you. It's inevitable. You'll be judged. The last verse, read here in, in verse 19. It says, the teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way. We've already read the verse. I just want to draw something out. Looked for a way to arrest him when? Immediately. Immediately. Right, like right now. Because they knew he had spoken this parable against them. But they were afraid of the people. Now, they were afraid of the people, but they weren't afraid of God. Do you know? We have a nation leader right now who would kill Jesus right now if they could. Why don't they? Because they're afraid of the people. There's still enough of us. Right. There, there, listen, there's still enough of us to make a difference. Yeah. There, there, there's still enough of us to vote them out. There's still enough of us to, 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 to get this thing back right. Yeah. There, there's, there's still enough of us. And so, so they're afraid of the people. But if they had their way, they'd kill him in the school, and they've already done a pretty good job of that. If they had their way, they, they would kill him in politics because you, can't, you know you can't. You've got to separate the church. and you, you can't you got to separate the church and state. They'd kill him right now. It's our, pro it's our fault, right? It's, it's, it's those Tea Party people. That's, that's the problem. <laughs> oh, it's those conservatives. You know, those Jesus freaks. They're the problem. They'd kill him right now if they could. What are we going to do? Their nation's leaders killed Jesus. <laughs> what will our nation's leaders do? One more thought. We're done. Oh. Um, in a very personal way, you have your personal vineyard. God's given you something to tend. You have your family. You have your children. You have your finances. You have your occupation. You have your influence. How are you doing with it? What, what are you doing with it? Are you making it fruitful? Is he finding justice or bloodshed? What, what's, what's he finding? What, how, how are you doing with it? See, I believe that I'm looking at some good kingdom keepers. I really do. I, I know that you're making a difference, that you're keeping your vineyard very, very well. I know you are. I know you are. But do you think that we could all do just a little bit better? Do, do you think that maybe we could take our voting privileges just a little more serious? I got to do that. So we, we can make a difference, but we got to do it. <laughs> Do, do you think that maybe we could stop slicing up preachers and those who are sent to us to bring the word of God and stop stoning them so that our children won't hear us do that kind of stuff and that we could change the generations to come? Do you think we could turn off our mouth and keep our brains open? Stop yelling at the television or whatever? I think so. You're great kingdom keepers because we've got to stop saying, <laughs> not us. Not us. May this never be. I hope it doesn't happen to us. Because what does it mean then? If you reject the stone, the stone's going to come back on you. Doesn't matter if you fall on it or it falls on you. It's coming back. Let's pray for it. Father, thank you for our time together. Father, I pray for these people. Lord, they are good kingdom keepers. Father, they're tending their vineyards. And Father, I just pray right now. The Lord, you cause us all, that you stimulate us all to do more. To, to be better, to use our influence, Father, upon the people that we can, that we can, that we can, we can do some good for, for, the, for the kingdom of God. And Lord God, I ask you now to bless us. Father, I pray for them that they'll, they're healed in their bodies. Father, I pray that they're healed in their minds and their souls. And I bless their families. And Father, I bless their finances. And I, I bless them every single way that I possibly can because I know that's what you want to do. So Father, I ask you now, to take care of us and bless us in Jesus' name. And Father, we pray for our nation. Our nation, Lord, needs you. Help us turn back. Our children, Lord God, have to change. Our children today are the leaders tomorrow. And Lord, I ask you to bless them. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.